Hello everyone and welcome to day 60 of Bitwise, where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Uh, today we continue with things related to sequential logic. Last time we uh, kind of got a FIFO working. It turned out there were some bugs that I, well, I kind of shut off the stream without fully wrapping my head around what the bug was. Uh, it turned out the supposed fix that I had put in at the end of the last stream was actually, didn't really fix it. It actually made some things worse. Uh, and I found the the, the the real fix uh, after the stream shut off. So um, let me just show you what that was. The actual the issue was actually not when the FIFO per se. It was in the memory. So um, let me jump to our implementation of memory. And so far we're still using our own implementation. Um, I've been too busy with other things to do the uh, built-in implementation of memory. Um, uh, I, I know I promised I would, but I've uh, been busy with, with uh, exapunks uh, in my in my programming time pretty much. So I haven't, haven't gotten to that, but um, this lets me illustrate it with the existing stuff we have here. Um, what I put in is basically this thing here. So previously we had, uh, <clears throat> we just had this, which you might recall. Previously we just had this, <clears throat> oh, with a delay. <clears throat> like this, and the problem with this is that if you have a, a read and a write the same cycle, the read is going to <clears throat> not pick up on the write. It's as if the, even though they're simultaneous, it's what you would call a write after read semantics. Um, and that introduced an, an additional cycle of latency even beyond the, the, the delay itself. Um, and so I put in what is uh, usually called read after write semantics, which in this case means you know there's still one cycle of delay on the read data output, um, but in the case where a read and a write uh, are issued, you know when they're issued concurrently, the write is immediately visible to the read, <clears throat> and given that there's a delay before the write is committed, the way you do that is with uh, what's called a bypass or forwarding path, where um, you know, we still have this else branch, but we have what's called a bypass, which is this mux. And what the mux says is if, when we're issuing our read, if the write is enabled that cycle and the read address equals the, uh, the write address, then we directly forward the write data to the read data, bypassing the memory, um, because the data won't be in memory soon enough for us to pick it up using the mux. <clears throat> so this is a very standard uh, technique. Uh, when we get to CPUs, um, you will see this repeatedly in pipeline uh, processors. It's called you know, bypassing or forwarding. Um, and generally, it's when you want to make stuff available sooner than it otherwise would be going filtering through um, a, a register file, for example. Uh, but, but very common technique, uh, you know, bypassing or forwarding. But anyway, that was the issue here. Um, and then there was one more thing we had to do to make the FIFO work. Um, I'll actually show what we had last time, um, because I, I, I can do a slightly, I guess, less efficient version first. Um, I think what we had last time would, was something like this, not empty is uh, read adder is not equal to write adder uh, and not full is equal to read adder not equal to write adder plus one. Uh, if I write this, it should work. Let me just test that it does. Uh, it should be underscore not dot. Um, this should work. Um, and since uh, these ready signals are direct outputs from the read signals, by the way, this notation here is just because I am kind of declaring the output separately from defining them, defining their, their operand that drives them. So here we're specifying the type of the thing and then we're connecting them here. This slice assignment notation is just a shorthand for uh, calling the connect method. I just, it's a little more, I guess, evocative to use this assignment style or whatever, um, but that's just what it means. So it doesn't mean anything that we weren't doing before. It just separates the declaration from the definition of the contents of, of, of those output ports. But anyway, so these are now combinations. So this works. Th these are so-called combinational outputs, um, meaning that these uh, ready uh, ready output values are the result of, of a computation. They're not just a direct register output. They're the result of a computation. Um, quite often when you're designing these modules, you try to keep all your outputs uh, registered 
in order to decouple the timing. So that's not always true, um, but it's a good rule of thumb that when you provide outputs from this kind of black box, it's not just like a sub-module that's used to build a bigger module, but when you're really providing some self-contained black box for others to use, you ideally want to have registered outputs in most cases because it lets uh, the timing become decoupled. So you don't, so when you read from those outputs, the only delay is really the <clears throat> the direct output delay of the register, not whatever internal logic drives that output. So you, you would want these, ideally in most cases, you want these things to be registered outputs rather than combinational outputs. Um, <clears throat> but one problem in general when you move to registered outputs is that by the time the consumer sees the output from the register, it will be based on data that was fed to it one cycle ago, right? Because a register provides one cycle of delay. So uh, you have to be careful about how you define it. Uh, and you'll note here that when we define the next value of not, not empty, we have to use the next values of the read adder and the write adder. We can't use the current adder, uh, the current read adder and the current write adder because those are always going to be one cycle out of date by the time the value becomes visible through the register. So um, when you're using registered outputs, you'll, you, you should usually think of, you, you should learn to think kind of one cycle ahead. And the cleanest way to do that is you know, start with the, with the logical expression and then move everything to be like dot next. I mean, you should think it through whether it makes sense in context, but that's sort of a, a pretty generic recipe. And that's what we do here. You can see we took the old expression and we just had it dot next for all the things um, uh, here. So that way, uh, this defines, you know, this here, this is a combinational expression, right? That defines the values of read adder and write adder the next cycle which you know which are con conditionally incremented depending on whether you're dequeuing or enqueuing and so this will correctly take into account whether this cycle you're enqueuing and dequeuing to compute whether um whether something is empty or, or full the next cycle so anyway um with, with these accommodations you now have registered outputs and with the fix to the memory to provide read after write semantics with with this bypassing trick internally which is a very common implementation technique in, in digital design. Uh, we now have a working implementation uh, with decoupled outputs, registered outputs. Um, and let me just, the thing I didn't test last time, which I should have, is uh, basically the reason certain bugs weren't exposed last time is that I let the consumer and producer run too much in lockstep, which meant that things never, never actually filled up. Um, and so there's a an edge case with the uh, with the code from last time where it would allow it to become one cycle over full, and so it would actually wrap around and overwrite the first element. Uh, so one way you can get around that is just to add before you start consuming anything, just add some 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 idle cycles for the consumer, allowing the whole thing to fill up completely before you start dequeuing. Um, of course, you want to test both cases of both things sort of operating more or less in lockstep, and also the producer filling things up completely before the consumer gets a chance to dequeue it. Uh, here I just have one test case. I should really have two test cases, to be honest. Um, but uh, but yeah. So um, that's it for the FIFO. Today I'm going to kind of continue in a similar vein. Um, I'm going to co cover a few different... Um, I'm going to cover at least one other FIFO implementation technique. Uh, which is particularly useful in Silinx FPGAs and pretty much only in Silinx FPGAs. In theory, it will work, you know, in any setting, but um, Silinx FPGAs have um, a special kind of uh, building block built in that makes it attractive to, to use this implementation technique. And I think it's also a fun example of how, um, you know, basically, if you look at how we implemented the FIFO with a ring buffer, this is 100% like how you do it in software. Like, there's basically no difference between how this is implemented in hardware and how you would do it in software. You have a memory. Uh, the main difference is we have a local memory that's instantiated just for the FIFO, whereas in software, we have a big, you know, we typically have a big RAM that's used for, you know, for everyone. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much the same technique. We have a memory. We have, um, you know, a ring buffer style addressing where the pointers wrap around. We have two cursors that specify the, the front and back of the queue. Um, so it might surprise you that this is the preferred uh, implementation technique, even in hardware. Um, but um, there are actually other t techniques that, like I said, can be situationally useful. And the one I'm going to talk about next is, um, I think is interesting because it's something that 
you can implement the software, but it's very slow in software. It doesn't really scale in software. But in hardware, because of you know the inherent parallelism of hardware, um, it is actually um, you know can be very fast, basically. So, um, and, and the idea here is rather than using you know this kind of ring buffer memory, we're going to use a, a very special kind of memory called a shift register memory or an addressable shift register or something like that. So a shift register um, is the following idea. I think I've mentioned the word repeatedly, and, and I think even in software nomenclature, people kind of know what a shift register is. A shift register is just when you have a chain of registers that feed into the other. Some people associate shift registers with single bit elements so that, you know, for example, in software, if you've ever heard of linear feedback shift registers, quite typically that means single bit elements that are being shifted over by one bit every cycle, and then some of the bits are wrapped around when they fall off the end or whatever. Um, but um, really, it works even with multi-bit elements. So um, let's uh, let's define this as a special kind of memory. Uh, and um, the way it's going to work is pretty similar. Um, so we're going to instantiate. Yeah, let, let's just again assume it's a power of two. Uh, we have an address type based on number of bits. Um, so we actually let, let, me, let me. I guess we can just put it in the, in the file itself. Um, so um, anyway, we start out with a memory much as before, um, and we are going to have a read port essentially that works exactly as before. Um, and so let's say we have a um, we have a uh, a read input. Um, well, and we have a read output. And let, let's ignore bypassing for now. I think we'll probably need to support bypassing the way we were doing it before as well. Um, but basically, uh, read. Ignoring that stuff, uh, you can do the same thing you did before, where you use the read adder um, to pick out what cell to um, to read using this mux function. So if you compare to what we wrote for the memory, I think it should be should be the same thing, like this part here. Again, we're ignoring the bypassing for a moment. Maybe we'll even ignore the output delay. Um, and then. Uh, What's different is there isn't just a there isn't a random access write port. Instead, there's a shift port. Um, and so, let's see. The way uh, and I'll, I will call it shift rather than write, just to emphasize this. There's first of going to be a shift enable, and then there's going to be a shift data port. Um, and there's no address because the way it works is um, let's see here. The way it works is every cell except well let's see. Maybe I want to do it for every cell except the first one. Um, for every cell, let's see. I guess we also don't need this. What we can do is we can sip together this. This will do the right thing. Um, so here we're pairing every cell with its previous member in the chain. Um, and um, the value is such that if shift is enabled, then we get the previous value. Otherwise, we get our own value. So this is really the idea. So if you look at what this means, you basically have um, you have all of these cells that are sequential according to their address, and um, normally when shift is not enabled, they just retain their value, right? Uh, the same as any register. Um, but when you shift, what happens is um, everyone moves over one spot, so. Um, the new cell cell one value becomes the old cell zero value. The new cell two, va two value becomes the old cell one value. And then that leaves a gap, which is the very first value. And that's where we shift in the data. Um, incidentally, this has the effect of completely shifting out 
the last element. So the very last element in the cell uh, just gets lost. Um, so that's a condition generally you don't want to allow to happen. And in the use of, when we use this to implement a FIFO, that will correspond to a full condition. So you're not supposed to shift uh, for that implementation. You're not supposed to shift when the thing is full. But uh, anyway, that's how that works. So and, and then uh, for the very first cell, you have to kind of do it a little bit special. Um, and actually, one way we can do it is like this. Um, let's see. Maybe we can do it, say, uh, shift data plus cells, something like this. I think that will work. This is going to be one element larger than this, but the behavior of SIP is to always uh, cut to the common longest length. Um, Yeah, let's see if this is right. So shift data, cells zero. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so this is pretty much it. Um, let's see if that works. OK. Um, see here just uncommon this old stuff and so uh, let's say shift, shift menu memory example we will compile the shift memory with yeah I guess uh, 8 bit elements 64 things I guess because it doesn't, yeah. Why wasn't this an issue with the other memory? Oh, we used, did I say when? I should have used mux, it's a typo. Excuse me. Um, oh, right, we have to put the decorator. Okay. Um, so let's see. So simulate test shift memory example. Um, Uh, let's see, what kind of test do we want to do? Um, shift memory test. So I think what we're going to do is um, I guess well Let's see. Um, let's do some kind of uh, in the ith cycle. We um, we shift in the value i. Um, we wait for that to get shifted in. And then we uh, verify, let's see. So when that is shifted in, I guess, uh, and then we temporary, we, we turn off the shift. So then we're going to read some stuff back. Um, well, I, I guess we can shift in all of it and then we can check it. Maybe we'd want to have other tests as well. Um, anyway, then at this point, um, what we're going to do 
is we're going to say read adder equal to i um, and I guess we'll we will shift these in in reverse order because of the shift register the first thing to get shifted in will be the last in the chain ultimately so let's move through in reverse order so the other thing can be first because it doesn't really matter we could reverse either of them um, and then here we're going to do these uh, and then we're going to well uh, let's do some output delay oops do some output delay on this so we to have registered outputs so to make it a little more realistic and so then at every point you want to check that this equals that um, see if that works that may have a bug okay uh, Right. So this is the shift memory, right? We have re we have standard random access read ports, but the shifting is not done random access. It's always done uh, by shifting something in from the side. Um, okay, so that works. Um, one thing this doesn't check is whether things are bypassed correctly. So if I... Um, if again, if if I mean, and it doesn't have to be this way, but I think this is probably what we want. If you want, um, hmm. if you want to, if there's a read at the same time as there is a shift. And you want the read to reflect the value that was concurrent with it. In other words, read, read after write semantics. Um, then we have to do something similar to the bypassing we did before. Um, and, well, um, what's the easiest way to do that? You could do something like this. In fact, I think we could probably have done that with the other implementation as well. Um, this may not be the best way to do it either. Like you could do it by altering what value. Let's try this. I think that works. Um, Oops. So yeah, it, sh it shouldn't really affect the result of this because at this point we're we're executing the reads after all the writes, so after all the shifts have already been uh, completed. But um, if you wanted to, uh, suppose this is one test. Let's do two tests. Um, so this will be test one. And this will be test two. Um, let's see. So in test two, we're going to, well, let's see. We're going to issue a read concurrently. Um, we can do one particular test. We're always reading the first element and then we're asserting that the thing we just put in is as expected. That, that's not a full exhaustive test of this, but um, that will do, I think, to at least kick the tires. All right. Um, because so, so here what we're doing is we're shifting stuff in and then we're, adder zero is going to be the newly shifted element. And so this will immediately, uh, should be the thing we put in here. You could do another test where you're checking the um, 
you know, the last element of the sequence we're shifting in is, is, is appropriately handled. Okay, so that works. So anyway, um, let's take that as a starting point and say that, you know, uh, this seems to work. Now let me show you how you can implement a FIFO with this. And I'm going to do it by actually talking about software for a sec, because I'll show you the implementation of this technique in software, and then I'll show it using the shift memory how um, basically, um, you know, why the technique, which turns out to be fairly bad in software, is, is quite good in, in hardware or can be good. It's not widely used, but it, it, in theory, it, it, it's in, in theory, it's a good idea. It's, it's good in Silex FPGAs uh, because they have some built-in support for it. It doesn't scale to large FIFOs. It has some power consumption issues, but in terms of delay, it's pretty good. Um, so the idea is the following. Um, suppose you wanted to do a, a FIFO. Um, back by an array and it's not going to be a ring buffer array in fact it's just going to be a standard pushback oh, sorry it's not it's just going to be a standard array uh without any fancy addressing so it's just a list um and i'm going to so let's just say you know this is a double variable for illustration purposes let's say i want to enqueue an element um well actually let me talk about dequeuing first because that's the easy part if you want to dequeue you simply uh you simply take the last element um you don't have to specify anything in this case. You simply take the last element of the array, and then you, um, well, let's maybe let me be a little more explicit. Um, I guess you can do it like this if you want. Um, Something like this. So in other words, when you're dequeuing, you just take stuff from the end of the array. Uh, and, and maybe this thing is like zero initialized or whatever. Uh, max length. Um, and so fixed size array, again, because we're going to be using hardware, i just trying to bring the analogy as close as I can. Fixed size array, but then you have essentially the, the only cursor is the length of the, uh, of the array. And, and this behaves much like a normal... Uh, you know, uh, size of a dynamic array where you have both a capacity and a size, and the size can grow and shrink at the uh, very quickly at the end of the array. And so this is all we're doing here. So DQ, it's really just like a, a stack pop from the end of an array. Um, now the enqueuing is where in in software uh, you go wrong because if you want to have this representation, you basically have to do something like this. You have to um, um, let's see if this is the right representation. You have to do something like this. You you increment the well. Um, you basically do this. You take the existing data. Um, well, I guess you would say max length. Since we want to keep fixed capacity, you take the existing data and you move everything over by one spot. Um, and then you put in x, and then you increment length. Uh, and so the expensive part here is the shifting, right? Because you basically have to, in order to do this, you have to do this insert at the beginning of an array, which means that all the existing elements after that position have to be copied over one spot. Um, and that takes linear time if you're doing it serially. But the idea is that in hardware, if we use a shift uh, memory for this operation, then the shift itself, basically all the registers that are shifting over one spot, all of those shifts are happening in parallel. And in fact, it can be done with very small delay. You basically just have a flip-flop connected immediately to an adjacent flip-flop, and you flip an enable signal that says, hey guys, move over one spot. Uh, and then the very first uh, uh, register in the chain becomes vacant, and you can put in the new element there, which is uh, X. Um, and so... You know this works in software. It's not a very good implementation in software. It's it's fine if you have only a few elements because then it doesn't really matter too much. And maybe this is even better because you don't have to worry about you know the I guess slightly more complex logic of a ring buffer. But uh, clearly this is a bad idea in software when you scale to a medium sized queue. But in hardware, um, at least from a delay perspective, this is not a problem if you use this kind of shift memory. So um, that's what I'm going to show you is basically just do another FIFO. Um, 
implementation using our shift memory instead of a normal memory. And I will just call it a shift FIFO. And maybe I should call the other one a ring FIFO. See if I remember shortcut control shift one. Okay. And so right shift FIFO. Um, so I'm going to have exactly the same interface, so in fact the same test can be used. So we're going to have uh, all of this stuff the same as before. Um, and now, instead of having a read and a write cursor, we're just going to have a length. And so the length is going to be um, is it really the length, or is it the end of yeah, I guess it's kind of like the length. Um, This is another case where if you have 16 entries and you have a 4-bit length, then you can't distinguish empty versus full. So you probably want to have an extra bit. Um, an extra bit. I'll call it the length type. You want to have an extra bit for that if you want to distinguish those two. And, and here it's quite easy to do so. You can make it work up there too. But um, let's just do it like that. All right. Um, so, so what's the logic now for um, for dequeuing? So first off, you can dequeue. So when can you dequeue? You can dequeue when the length is non-zero. Um, however, again, if we're doing uh, delayed, let, let's do it with. Uh, I guess let's start with non. Uh, non-registered outputs. It's usually slightly easier to get that working, and then you can add the registration of the outputs uh, afterwards. Uh, with, with the, so you can see how we do that transformation. So anyway, th so the DQ is ready if the current length is basically not equal to max length, which is uh, if if these two things. Okay, no semicolon. Uh, if if the length. No, sorry, that's uh, if this is non-zero. That's what I wanted to say. So you can DQ if the length is non-zero. Um, you can NQ if the length is not equal to the size, size being the, the max capacity, right? Um, OK, um, so that's it for that. Now about the DQ data, we're dequeuing. Um, we're, we're going to have a, a memory, and it's going to contain, you know, like that. Um, the read adder is going to come from the length, but maybe it has to be the length plus one uh, or the next length. So uh, before we move to that, let's think about what happens to the length. Uh, this is going to be slightly interesting because there's a couple of different cases to consider. Um, when you're thinking about what happens to the length, you know, of course, it can stay the same if there's no activity. It can shrink by one if there is uh, a decrement. It can grow by one if there's a, oh, sorry, it, it can shrink by one if there's a DQ. It can grow by one if there's an NQ. But if there's both an NQ and a DQ, then it doesn't change length, right? Because um, on the one hand, you take out an element, but the other hand, you put in an element. So there's a net change of zero in the length. So there's a little bit of a case analysis. And you can choose to structure it differently. Um, like you could choose to have an increment for those separately and then add them, or you could just do sort of a three-way, you know, you could do a case analysis for these. So for example, um, I think probably the easiest way to do it is, um, you know, as before, the condition for a, an NQ or DQ actually happening is for both the ready and the enable signal to be asserted. Um, Uh, 
Um, so let me think. Um, let me write some helper variables. Um, let's see. I think this works if so this is true if they're both if, if neither or both are happening then we, we we don't change the length otherwise um if there's an nq i guess you can also write it like this in terms of finding an increment um so it can change by either zero or one or minus one. I think that works. So, if if um, if if neither enqueuing or dequeuing is happening, then it doesn't change because there's just straight up no change to the queue period. Uh, if both happen, then there's also no change to the length because while it grows in one, it immediately shrinks by one. Uh, otherwise, if there is an NQ, then it grows by one. Otherwise, and in this case, it must be the case that there's a DQ and then it shrinks by one. I think it's something like this. Um, so I think that's the logic for the length change. Um, in fact, let's, let's move this down here. Um, okay, so let's now do the memory part. So the memory part. Oops, the memory part looks like this, and the read adder, I think because of the one cycle delay, um, I think you have to use the, ne the, lex the next length uh, to feed this. And then the DQ data is going to be, or not, I, not the next length, let me think about it. I guess it would be the next length minus one. Um, you can almost certainly incorporate, like rather than using the length, you can use like the read cursor, which is always off by one from the length or something like that. Um, but let's just do it here just to be, it's a little bit sloppy. We don't need an extra adder just to compute this, but um, let's do that just to get started and then we'll optimize it later. Um, and then the DQ data is uh, the read data from this. And the reason we're using length next is because this comes back a cycle later. Um, so if we want it to reflect the current state of the queue, we have to anticipate that delay. Um, for the shift, um, the shift happens if do and queue is asserted, in which case the NQ data is what we shift in. So it's something like this. Do, do, do. All right. Um, so let's let's start by just stealing some of these tests because uh, they should actually just work. A FIFO is a FIFO. All right. Um, yeah, we have to promote that. Normally, when you use a binary operation directly with the other thing, it will 
automatically infer the type of the um, of the of a literal, but in this case, the literals are going to be. In fact, this may not even. Let me think about this. I think even the when, probably. Let's split it out a little bit. Um, let's say this is the length delta. Um, you may have to be explicit about the lengths. Well, I guess just I can do this. All right, shift five zero. To use module L or module. All right, this is taking a while. Oh, I see. So it's just never making gotcha. It's just because NQ is never being asserted. Um, so probably there's just some some stuff there that's bu that's busted. <clears throat> Okay, so they're claiming NQ is not ready in cycle one. I mean, that should not be the case because if the length is zero, length is certainly not equal to 64. Thank you, ready is output. Let's 
six bits. That's not enough. I think that's the problem. Okay, let's just slice off the top bit for this purpose. Okay. Okay, so that actually seemed to work. I think it's good news. Okay. Um, let's try letting this thing fell. And that also works. Okay. Um, Instead of doing this, let's just keep it consistent with the other one where we intentionally don't let it fill up completely so that we never let it go higher than size minus one and then we don't have to do these shenanigans. And I think if that is the case, um, we should be good as well. Right. And again, you can let it fill up, but then you need an extra bit for the length. And that's cer almost certainly worth it, but just to keep it consistent, um, let's do the same thing we did for the ring 5.0. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it as far as that goes. Um, Let's look at registered outputs. Um, right, this is the. So if we do registered outputs, the main thing is we have to delay these. And so I think if we, uh, but then if you do that, you have to use the, ne the next length again, because you're anticipating the next cycle. Let's see if that works. Yeah, that works. Um, Let's do this in order to let the life of fill. All right. All righty. Um, um, okay, I guess uh, I somehow expected we would have to do deep, more debugging, but um, I guess we're getting into the swing of things. I, ha I haven't been doing hardware design until we started this series, uh, like this part of Bitwise, uh, for at least a year and a half. So I, I have to get back into the, the whole swing of like thinking one cycle ahead when you're doing registered outputs and all that stuff, figuring out how to structure a code so that uh, it, it doesn't become a mess. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm succeeded, but I, ca I can definitely find myself becoming a little more uh, back in uh, back in the habit now. All right. Um, so let's just say that's it for, for shift FIFOs. The reason this is an important implementation technique is specifically for Scilink FPGAs. Um, I haven't really talked about FPGAs at all so far because most of the stuff I'm covering is pretty generic. But um, maybe I will take this opportunity to, uh, to point you to what I'm talking about. And none of this will make sense because I haven't really explained any FPGA stuff yet. But uh, the idea is that um, both Scilink and Altera FPGAs have block RAMs, which are static RAMs, much like the ones we've defined ourselves. Um, 
and except unlike normal SRAMs, they have a lot of configurability. So you can choose the aspect ratio, how many bits per data type versus how many address bits. So you can kind of choose how how wide versus deep it is and so on. Uh, and, and, and you can configure all this read after write, all these different semantics you can kind of configure. Um, but Silinx FPGAs have another type of memory primitive called distributed RAMs or SRLs actually, which is a operating mode for for um, distributed RAMs. Maybe that is not. Maybe that is in the different. Yeah, okay. It's because it's under the CLB. Um, right. So I've alluded, um, uh, this is a little bit of a regression, but I've alluded before to how the basic logic building block in, the, and this is basically true both in Silinx and Altera, uh, the basic logic building block is not like a NAND gate or something like that. It's a six input, uh, one output, bit um, lookup table LUT, um, and the way the, the the way those LUTs are implemented internally is that it, they're essentially just a cascade of, of muxes, of two to one muxes, and you can configure what you know what the values are at config time when you set up the circuit, um, and that's reprogrammable, right? It's it's configured every time, like every each, each of the muxes. It's not only a mux; it's also the leaves of the mux, which ultimately specify the values uh, of the LUT, are little SRAM cells, basically. Um, and so they are inherently dynamic memory elements or dynamic in the sense that they can be reprogrammed. It's not like a mask ROM or something like that. Um, and so in, in theory, actually, all of the LUTs in any FPGA that has this kind of general design, in theory, all of them are reconfigurable dynamically, so can be used as RAMs. Now, the problem is only that the way they're configured is usually very slow, like there's a, a so-called scan chain or something like that that's used to initialize it at config time. So it's not something you can just do random access the way you're probably used to writing to RAMs. However, there's a subset of the LUTs that can be configured more like traditional addressable RAMs. Um, and this is only available on Silinx. I don't, uh, I think somewhat infamously, Altera doesn't have it available. I guess it's because of patents or something like that. Um, but there's also a specific operating mode of these distributed RAMs where they operate more like shift registers, where you have random access reads, but shift register style writes. Um, where is that? These. Uh, 32-bit shift register without using flip-flops. And these are addressable. You can see you can do a synchronous shift and what they call dynamic read. So um, up to five bits addressing. So that's 32 elements um, that you can read from. So you can do up to 32 element FIFO using this, which is often the, like 32 element FIFO. When you have a lot of FIFOs all around your chip for decoupling the different processing uh, stages, that's a that's a pretty good size. Um, and anyway, you can use these to uh, to implement the kind of FIFO I've described. Don't know if they talk about that here, but that is one of the standard uh, uses of those uh, shift register uh, blocks in, uh, or, which is really just an operating mode for the LUTs. But, but anyway, that's kind of one of the practical applications of this. But again, I also think it's just kind of a cool uh, a cool implementation technique because it's something that makes sense in software in the sense that you can implement it in software. And indeed, I'm sure you must have, there are definitely people who don't know about ring buffer FIFOs who have implemented in software this kind of thing and have discovered to their horror that rather than having constant time in queue, they now have linear time in queue. Well, if you do it in hardware, it's constant delay, right? So it's uh, that's kind of neat, and it does have practical applications. The main the main downside, by the way, of why you wouldn't want to build very large FIFOs with this technique on ASICs, where in theory you could do a custom shift register chain and all this other stuff, is that shift registers, if they're shifting all the time, uh, as FIFOs often are, they're typically operating. They're always stuff coming in and out of a FIFO, right? If they're being used um, 
to connect different stages of a pipeline or something like that. Um, the problem with shift registers is even though they have very small delay from, from, from register to register, they, um, they have a ton of power consumption because all of the elements are potentially changing their value every single cycle, right? Like you're, imagine you have an alternating, suppose it's a one bit shift register, like one bit per element and there's a bunch of them in a chain. Suppose you have 1024 of them in a chain and um, suppose there's an alternating sequence of zeros and ones or something like that. That means that every time you're shifting over every single shift, uh, every single one bit register in that chain is changing its value, which implies uh, a, a lot of power consumption, dynamic power consumption. Um, compare that to a ring buffer FIFO where, um, you know, the static RAM has very little power consumption and just maintaining the elements because they're not being shifted around every cycle. The only thing that's really being changed dynamically in that uh, SRAM that holds the ring buffer it, are the frontier, right? Like if it's writing something, uh, if it's enqueuing something, it has to write that element to the SRAM. But that's really the only dynamic power consumption in the ring buffer SRAM. Whereas when you use a shift register like this, potentially everything is changing all the time. So it scales very poorly to longer queues um, in terms of power consumption. Um, but delay is still pretty good. But but power is, you know, power is one thing that people worry a lot about on chips these days. All right. I think that's it. Um, let's see. Where are we on time? I want to, okay, so we have enough time. I want to, um, FIFOs are kind of the ideal entry point to this. I want to start talking about something called valid ready signaling. Uh, and I think I have a link in uh, the notes for today. There's a bunch of information on this online, but uh, this is one that I think is pretty accessible since it's written for students. Um, when you are building different processing blocks that are, you know, and this could be something like the multiplier we, we wrote before, where you get in, you know, operands, and then you work on the result for a bit, and then eventually you spit out a result. And, you know, internally, it can be pipeline so that it can accept a lot of data and have high throughput, but still have high latency. Or it could be very serial where, you know, maybe it only accepts a new input every 10 cycles. Um, and so whatever the case, you have these processing blocks and you want to have a way of connecting them together in a smooth way where you have a standardized interface. Probably the best way of doing that is using what's called valid ready signaling, or I guess they say ready valid signaling, which is something we're already doing basically. Um, and they, here they talk about the FIFO interface, but I guess it's important to note that when they say FIFO here, they don't necessarily mean a FIFO buffer. They just mean processing blocks that process their data in a first out, first out fashion. So the first, you know, if I take in a set of inputs, the corresponding output will arrive in order, uh, like in a FIFO fashion. But it doesn't mean that it's actually a queue. It, so this could be a multiplier where, you know, it accepts inputs in, in FIFO order, uh, or, or it accepts, it accepts inputs in some order and produces the outputs in FIFO order. So it doesn't reorder the elements on the output side or something like that. That's really what they mean when they say FIFO here. But of course, a FIFO queue is an example of such. That's why they're called FIFOs. Uh, but just wanted to clarify that shorthand, that this is not just for queues. This is for anything that has that FIFO ordering between inputs and outputs. Um, and this should look very familiar. Uh, really, the only difference between what we did for our buffer is that they're calling it valid rather than enable. Um, and so um, that's, that's really the only difference. However, I think something that's maybe a little more... Uh, uh, a little more serious, which we should probably go back and fix, is that um, if you look at, oh, we could take the ring FIFO as an example. Um, um, the stuff coming out of the module, like if you look at this here, on one side of the module, you can imagine module B here, which in this scenario is the sync. You can imagine, and this is a ring FIFO, and valid is the enable for the enqueue, data is the enqueue data, and ready is the enqueue ready. Um, if you look at the other side of this though, DQ has basically, what we're calling them here is potentially a little bit confusing because, um, from from a certain vantage point, the DQ data 
you can look at it from either the producers and the consumer standpoint. If you're the person consuming, then the data is coming into you. And so you could say that really here, these names should be DQ, um, you know, DQ ready is the input, DQ data is output, DQ valid. What do I call it? Yeah, uh, ready. No, wait. DQ enable is the output. Um, and, and this is maybe one argument for why valid and ready, even though they're kind of a little bit symmetric, why you, you kind of want to name them this way. So the whole enable terminology uh, doesn't confuse you in terms of what, what's coming in and out. Um, but anyway, the... Um, what what this really is is a handshaking protocol that lets two partners agree on when they're ready to execute a transaction. Because if I'm submitting something to a FIFO interface, and again, this could be a queue, but it could be also like a multiplier that's operating on inputs and outputs in FIFO order. Um, the important point is that both sides of that transaction, when I'm submitting something to say a multiplier, and when the multiplier is accepting the the, the inputs that we both have a mutual understanding of when a transaction has taken place. In this case, a transaction means a submission of an input. Um, and that's really what this protocol defines. Uh, it's a handshake, it's a handshake protocol. Um, and um, if you look at what both sides of this, um, of this transaction have to check, they have to check that this holds true from both their respective sides. DQ and like enable and ready if we're using this, or valid and ready if you're using their terminology in this doc, both of those have to be asserted at the same time for a transaction to take place. And because those both of those signals are exported, both sides can check that condition. And they can, so they can both check the same condition to know whether something took place. And they can take action, you know, in the, in the case of here, we increment a certain thing if a transaction takes place, and we also do some other stuff. We, we in the case of, of the write, we also write to something. We don't just update the write at or register and stuff like that. But that's kind of the idea is that when a handshake, you know, both sides have to have a consistent idea of, of when a handshake has taken place and so on. So that's what, what this provides. Now, um, I'll let you read the, yeah. So you, really the, this is exactly what I was talking about earlier. It's very common for for this sort of interface to be chained. That's really the main reason you use it. Um, is that you know you can, for example, you can take one FIFO and connect it to another. And um, it sorry, instead of rambling, let me just let me just show you that. Let me show you how you can make a uh, uh, like a, a FIFO from two smaller FIFOs. Um, um, and this is going to be an extreme case, not something you typically do, but just to illustrate the idea. One of the cool things about FIFOs is that if you take an N element FIFO and a, or an A, if you take a FIFO with a uh, capacity and a FIFO with B capacity, and you chain them together using this interface, from end to end, you effectively get a FIFO that has A plus B as their capacity. So you can you can abuse this to an extreme extent by um, basically um, taking a one element FIFO and just chaining it um, you know, N times in order to get an N capacity FIFO. So let's try that. Excuse me, let's try that as a simple example of this. Um, so let's see, external interface is the same stuff as before. Um, maybe I'll just have this internally. And uh, now our job is to essentially have a bunch of smaller FIFOs. Um, and I guess we can use a ring 
ringside though. But it could be anything. And so they still have the same, I guess the problem with doing this is that they can only fill up to their capacity minus one. So maybe we need to make it size two. Um, and then we just have to wire them up. So um, for the very first FIFO, we hook up the enable and the data. And uh, I guess the enqueue ready is going to be the enqueue ready from that first dude. And then for the um, for the DQ enable, we hook it up to the last one. Uh, and then for everything in the middle, we hook everything up to their um, to their predecessor. Well, let's see. Um, and this is where we have to do something, I guess, a little bit weird, you could say. So uh, next, let's see, uh, the enqueue enable of next is going to be the DQ ready of previous. So basically, as soon as this thing is ready, it's going to and queue something in the next FIFO in line. Um, and conversely, DQ sorry, and Q. And Q enable. I think something like this. Um, but then also, let me see if that's right. So that's for the NQ. What about the DQ? Um, DQ enable let's see I'm trying to visualize it Maybe that's it, actually. Um. 
Um, this has a high chance of not working the first time, but let's try. <clears throat> Compile. Change by bow. Chain five book sample, compile, chain five O sixty four. So I'll do it. Let's see if this works before I do anything else. Ring five O has no attribute. Thank you, ready. Thank you, ready to be an output. So why is that not? Oh. I guess we can do. Let's not pretend it's really. Okay. So that compiled. Um, let's see if it works. Probably it's one of these issues. I mean, it's making progress. I guess it's just really slow because there's so many different cues in play. Yeah, okay, it's actually working. Or, well, it's in queuing. I don't know if it's working. It's running from the command line. Running stuff under the debugger is so insanely slow.
Okay, run. It, it, I guess it's just slow period. Let's try PyPy, which has slower startup speed, but can be faster. After it gets going. Is it actually successfully dequeuing anything? That's my question. Guess that's the problem. Let's try this example with a really small FIFO, like two elements. Okay, so it works with two elements, what about four? Okay, so the the producer has finished and still thinks still thinks that it's not This is the issue. This should be previous uh, That's it. Well, that was a bug, I think. See. First FIFO in the chain is driven by the external interface. 
and the external ready signal is provided by that FIFO is ready signal. Then for everything subsequent, oh, here we also have to do So ultimately, this is the signal that is not correct. BQ is never becoming ready. Um, I guess let's look concretely. So here size is 4. Um, actually, let's go back to the size 2 case. This may be degenerate, but... So sizes two, we have two FIFOs. We hook up this one. Previous and next. So this should be okay. So the first FIFO, or the, sorry, the second FIFO, is hooked up to the DQ port of the first one. The previous DQ enable is hooked up to the NQ ready of the next one. So this should be, you know, the, the first one starts out empty. This should just work. Uh, no problem. That just works. Do three. Three works too. That's pretty interesting. I would kind of expect. And it works for, th for two and three, but not four. That's curious. Okay, so first iteration, I would expect this.
Aha. The last one does not have something hooked up. DQ enable. The last one is not hooked up. <sighs> oh, actually, that's not an issue because that happens here. Never mind, that's also on. Yeah. Um, okay, let's look at uh, let's look at let's look at it in the diagram. That looks weird. Or maybe not. I, the, the, the problem is with respect to the enqueuement, the order goes forward. So enqueue goes in there, DQ goes there. Yeah, that does look pretty reasonable. Actually. Okay, so that failed for a different reason, which is interesting. Same structure, you know, the shift hypos. Um, Well, I guess that could also be a latent uh, delay bug, or delay related bug, some of the stuff for the DQ data. Like, I do the read for length, for length next.
Interesting. So if it has size 4, it should go, when it fills up in this way, it should be zero, one, two, three. Um, here we've allowed, we, we've waited a good while, so this is definitely not some kind of concurrent read-write issue. Um, actually, I know what it is. Uh, well, do I? Let's see, if there are four elements there, I don't think this is quite right. I think it should be one minus one. Or not. Never mind. Let's stop screwing with this for now. I'm still a little bit suspicious of this, but um, Uh, okay, maybe don't want to rabbit hole on that too much. L let me do a final read of the code and see if I see something stupid. Otherwise, I'll call it a day for this. I've been finishing off these streams with bugs that I've then fixed off stream, for which I apologize, but um, some of this stuff is a little more harder to debug than normal software stuff. It's a lot of concurrency and a lot of internal state. It's not quite as observable as it might could be with better tooling. Um,
All right. Let's call it a day. Um, I'm feeling a little bit fried. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I would recommend you read this doc and study it and compare it to some of the cheating stuff we're doing. And maybe you can find my bug before I find it. Although I'll hopefully find it right after the stream. That's usually how this stuff goes. Um, so far, we're not doing very interesting things with these sorts of interfaces. But one of the, the great things about standardizing uh, the way you plug these things together is that you can take an existing data flow pipeline and you can insert buffers, for example, just by plugging something in the middle of the data flow and everything just kind of plugs in because they have the same protocol and, and uh, same handshaking idea, uh, same handshaking signals and, and semantics. Um, so we'll, we'll be exploiting that a lot uh, later on. It's a very good way to build sort of pipeline systems and plugging them together in a way that doesn't require you to build a ton of custom state machine control logic. Um, mostly just relying on this very simple pattern we've, we've already seen with the FIFOs. So uh, anyway, I think that's it for today. Um, Next time I want to, um, well, I've been thinking of of what to do next. Um, I think one thing that would maybe be fun to do is to start doing something involving IO. Um, we still don't have real hardware. And actually I said I was gonna bring my FPGA board on my holiday, but I, I forgot it in, my, uh, in, a, in a bag I'd already packed. So I don't have the ability to, uh, to compile stuff to FPGA from here. I'll do that when I come back uh, to Thailand in second week of September. So we'll have to wait, uh, we have to, wait to do the, um, the real honest to God hardware stuff until then. But for next time I was thinking um, we could s maybe start working on the Verilog simulator. Um, or working on some IO stuff, um, like IO interfaces um, to different things, like you know a UART or a VGA controller or something like that, emulated for now, but um, but st starting work on it, which would probably force us to add support for multiple clocks in the simulator. Right now, we only have one clock. Um, it's not very hard to add more, but um, anyway, I'll think about it. Maybe we'll do the Verilog stuff. Uh, and then maybe I can show some of the FBA tools. You can basically run the whole tool flow for Silinx and Altera without having a board. Um, so maybe I'll start work. Uh, maybe we'll start towards that end in uh, in the next session or the one after that. Um, anyway, so um, that's it for now, and I will see you next time.